Mark chapter 5. Get that in one hand and get uh, Acts 19 in the other. Mark chapter 5 and Acts 19. Now, I've enjoyed the stay here and been treated right by the Brother Smith and the folks and appreciate the chance to preach to you. We've had a Bible conference here in our revival, and uh, this will be a Bible conference tonight, a study on a portion of the Scripture that deal with demonology. And uh, I'm really a teacher of the Word of God more than a, not a preacher. I, am, I enjoy teaching, do a lot more of it than I do preaching. But uh, Bob Jones Sr. said this. He said, any man that teaches ought to teach evangelistically. And he said, any man that's an evangelist ought to teach folks something. So when I preach, I try to teach something. When I teach, I try to do a little preaching. And it upsets folks. I mean, if you just come at you just cool and calm and collected and objective, why well, folks wouldn't get so ruffled. But uh, I don't see how a man can teach the Word of God cool and calm and objective in every place. Some of it isn't very cool. Some of it's hot. It's hot as Tabasco sauce. All right, now if you have a Bible tonight, turn to Acts chapter 19 for just a minute before we get into Mark 5. And notice once again, like I showed you this morning in Acts 19, the occurrence of this uh, archaic word, so-called, in this 14 James Bible, nobody can understand. Ha ha. Acts 19:13. Certain vagabond Jews exorcists. See it? Acts 19:13. That Bible's not out of date. That Bible's more up to date than you'd care to read. I like what Mark Twain said about it. He said, it's not the things of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the things I do understand. And you take that in, Mark, in Acts chapter 19, verse 13, where that word occurs. Would you look down at the next verse there and notice those fellows are priests? Look at it. Don't take my word for it. It's your dime store Bible. It's so far ahead of Hollywood, they'll never catch up. Now, that isn't all. Keep on looking down there about two more verses. Acts 9, you look at verse 13, 14, 15, 16, and notice that's where your streaker comes from. <laughs> See that streaker in there? Streakers are connected with demons. Why didn't they tell you that in the movie? Why, why come to have the streakers over here and the demons over here? You don't separate them like that in the Word of God. Hadn't they ever struck you as being kind of odd or peculiar? But folks are always terribly interested in biblical things as long as they're removed from a biblical setting. However, could you kind of strange if the greatest interest in this world is always shown in biblical things if they're taken out of the Bible and perverted and put into a secular setting? Remember all those folks that had such a reaction over Rosemary's baby? Rosemary's baby? Mary's baby? My, 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 my. You remember all that stink about Jesus Superstar? Remember all that? Americans are fanatical about the Bible, as long as it's not in a biblical setting. They like it taken out and put into a sex setting, or a Hollywood setting. They go nuts over it. Now, you take this exorcist thing that came out recently. A lot of talk about that. Folks stand in line to look at papers saying, what do you think about it? So-and-so says this. So-and-so says this. Eminent psychiatrists are now looking at all that. Oh, kid stuff. Kid stuff. Turn to Mark 5. Anybody that knew Mark 5 wouldn't waste 35 cents to see that little girl get sick. Turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 is a scientific dissertation on demonology. And I define it by the world. If I ain't place in that Bible where anybody had to mess with a demon too long. Nobody that Bible goes back and says, get out, you unclean spirit, and goes away and prays three days, and come back and said, in the name of Jesus Christ and blessed Joseph, Hail Mary, John the Baptist, and Michael, get out. Not in that book. Listen, that book, when they cast them out, they leave. They leave. Whoever did that job in the Exodus movie did a pretty bum job. Did a pretty bum, bum job. They must not have the right thing. All right, now you take Mark chapter 5. We're going to begin at verse 1, and we're going to come right down through verse 20. That's a study on demonology. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And he came across the other side of the sea in the ship, and it came the country of the Gadarenes. And immediately there met him out of the tombs a man having an unclean spirit who dwelt among the tombs. Now before you continue any further, turn to Luke chapter 8, look at verse 27. And notice that fellow's a streaker. Luke 8, 27. Luke 8, 27. 
I think it's 827 or 927. 9, 8. Okay, 827. See what it says about that fella? Doesn't it say he was naked? Doesn't it say he was naked? That's your crowd. You see, Americans, they like to read about it with little college kiddies running around without the clothes on. Why didn't you read it in there? They like to read about somebody come saying, you unclean spirit, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I wonder how come you don't spend your time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John instead of uh, real movies and Hollywood screen romance and all that kind of business. Folks in America, they're Bible facts. They're crazy about the Bible. As long as it's removed from the Bible and stuck someplace else. Like color fellow said down south, he said, you keep saying you got that out of the Bible. He said, you must have got that out of the Bible because it ain't in it. <laughs> all right, now Mark chapter 5 come down through there. And he said, this fellow had his dwelling among the tombs. Did you know that's highly significant? Had his dwelling among the tombs? Or did you know one clean spirits and demons and devils have an affinity for dead men? They have an affinity for graveyards. Do you know there are such things as ghouls? We had a fellow break into a graveyard down in Pensacola about 15 years ago. Dug open the grave. A little old 12-year-old girl was buried. Took the body out and chewed on it. Found teeth marks all over the corpse. Somebody said, that fellow was mentally unbalanced. No, no, that ain't mental. That's spiritual. You don't get that far off mentally. They found a fellow up there in the Minnesota. I remember reading about Life magazine about 19 years ago. And they looked into his meat house up there in the winter. And he had a froze meat in that ice house. When well, they got concerned in the thing and looking at it pretty carefully, they found out he'd done uh, dismembered about 15 bodies and had cadavers hanging up in his meat house, eating them when he got ready for it, roasting meat and eating it. Called one of these out in California and found some of his fingers in his pocket. Somebody said they have metal problems. No, they don't. No, they don't. Nobody read that Bible ever make that mistake. Only a psychiatrist would make that mistake. you got something working there more than mental. Uh, demons have an affinity for tombs, for dead people. Did you know the Bible says, let the dead bury the dead? You know the Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she yet liveth? Dead while she yet liveth? Uh, the Bible likens unsaved people to dead people. And if you're an unsaved person, you have an affinity for dead people. You know what the Lord said to some Christians? Awake, thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And that wasn't written to an unsaved man, written to a saved man. Some saved people are always hanging around unsaved people. They got an affinity for dead people, dead bodies. They made him out of the tombs, a man, having an unclean spirit. Uh, you say, how do you spot the thing? By a deadness. You see, when you saw the exorcist, or when your friends did, they forgot the devil's primary realm was religious. The devil isn't primarily interested in put on a horrible, filthy show. He's primarily interested in worship. Did you ever go to a dead church? Did you ever get in a dead service? Did you ever get in a service where it was just as, just as flat and cold and dead as a funeral home? Now, I don't know how you are in a spiritual discernment, and if you don't have a spiritual discernment, you ought to pray and ask God to give you some. But you know something? That buildings and houses and homes and hotels and motels and hospitals have a certain uh, aura about them? Did you know that? Did you know there's an atmosphere in a hospital that's different than the atmosphere in a youth camp? You say it was just the sound. Oh, it's not the sound. It's an accumulation of sound and smell and personalities and radiation, electronics. Um, you take me stand right here right now. See him standing here right now? You know what's going through me? All kind of stuff. All kind of stuff. If I could just get the right transmitter and amplify on this ear, click this ear, I'd pick up one radio station, twist my nose and get another one. <laughs> Do you ever take a shortwave set? Put a shortwave set right here, put it behind you and change stations. Do you ever take a shortwave radio and put it here and take the antenna, put it up this way, drop it down this way, and go from Dusseldorf on the end of Paris? Do you know, do you realize sitting right here in this building listening to me talk right now, that thing is going through your body and through your head? I'm not speaking the standpoint of a dark age medieval exorcist. I'm talking from a scientific, empirical, existential, pragmatic, etc. baloney standpoint. You're sitting right here tonight in those chairs and pews, and while you're sitting there, there's stuff going through you that if you could tune in, you'd go crazy. 
The only reason is you can't tune in. Kid gets full of that pot and that grass, and that LSD and that snow and that heroin, and pretty soon he tunes in. Now, let's don't kid ourselves. If you think all it says is what you can see, you're not even scientific. The old kid gets in that pot and grass, and pretty soon he sees trains come out of him. It turns into a snake. Blue and yellow come down. And the green and orange pop out the of the star this way. Frog pops up. Whoop, he goes into the snake. Goes up over here. Pop, falls off the top of the thing. What's he doing? He's picking up television programs in color. But they're all mixed. They're all mixed. <laughs> now, you think about that four or five years. <laughs> and there's plenty goes on in this world, brother. I have never liked a funeral home. I don't like to go to them. I go to them, I preach funerals, I don't like them. A funeral home has a certain atmosphere about it. I don't care who's being buried or who just died. It's got a certain spirit about it. Any of them. I remember right after I got saved, I went back to Pensacola, Florida, and walked into a large juke joint there, a a upholstered hellhole, and went in there where I used to play drums in a dance band, I passed out tracks all through that place. And when I went through that place passing out tracks and going up and down there giving folks tracks, you know what it was like? It was like walking in a snake pit. I stepped in there and came in that door and immediately just something just pushes in like this. You feel like you're stepping through mud. You understand, just a dance hall. And you go through there and pass out tracks. And as I went through there, the bodies would part ahead of me. Walk across the floor, there's an automatic parting of bodies. If I walk around the table, there's an automatic shift over here and shift over here and shift over. There's spirit stuff going on there, man. Dead bodies. Dead bodies. Had his dwelling among the tombs. Okay, keep on reading. Come down verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4. And he said he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him. No, not with chains. For he'd often been bound by fetters and chains. And the chains had been broken in pieces. And the fetters plucked asunder by him. Neither could any man tame him. Now I learned the next thing about demon possession is unnatural strength. No man could chain him. No man could bind him with fetters or chains. Because the chains had been broken in pieces. And the fetters plucked asunder. And no man could tame him. I learned two things about demon possession in this passage. You would not have learned by watching The Exorcist. I learned one of the marks of demon possession is superhuman strength. I learned, number two, one of the marks of demon possession is folks don't respond to love. Now, you might have learned that from the show, but you could have learned it from a dime store Bible. Save you some money. Brother uh, Smith here, if you didn't have a Bible, he'd probably rustle up one for you free or... Sold you on a dollar back there. You not blow your money to find out some fool thing like that. That Bible said that fella couldn't be tamed and that fella couldn't be chained. Now I'm not saying that everybody has unnatural strength as demon possessed. Don't get me wrong. I know sometimes in the Saint Asylum it takes four or five men to hold a man down in a bed. And I'm not saying all those people are demon possessed. Those of us that believe Bibles, we got better sense than that. I mean, somebody said, well, you know how dumb the Christians were back in the Dark Ages. They took those poor mentally sick people and chained them up, put chains on them, put them in dungeons. Hold the phone, brother. Those weren't Christians. Nobody believed the Bible treated a, 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 a maniac like that. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says, comfort the feeble-minded. That Bible makes a clear distinction between those possessed with lunacy and those possessed with devils. God, don't make any mistakes. That bunch of folks that said everybody who was a lunatic was demon-possessed, those weren't Christians. They were Romans, not Christians. A Bible believer, don't make that mistake. Who's ever doing that has much, got much regard for the Bible. I might have said everybody in the insane asylum was demon-possessed. I'm not saying that. Might have pathological trouble. I mean, the trouble might be uh, something to do with bone structure, or cell structure, or brain structure, or circulation. It might have something pathological to do with it was, it was physical. It might be emotional problems. I'm not talking about emotional and physical right now. I'm talking about spiritual. And I'm telling you right now, some of the superhuman strength is demoniac. They have things in Kung Fu and Gung Fu, the two branches of that thing. Where you knock a man down with waves, you don't knock him down with a fist. You knock him down with a radiation concentration. 
You say, believe that kind of stuff? Yes, very definitely, some of them. Very definitely, very definitely. There was a fellow down there at Daytona Beach called Little Moses. And little Moses had a standing offer of a thousand dollars for anybody who can lift him off the ground when he don't want to be lifted. And when he don't want to be lifted, you can't get him off the ground. That bird stand out in the street, sidewalk, cement, your front yard. You don't have to have a platform. Stand out there on the beach and say, okay, lift me. You can't lift him. Charles Atlas and the angel about tore him limb from limb trying to get him off the ground. <laughs> little Moses is about five feet four. When he makes up his mind he ain't going to get lifted, he don't get lifted. Somebody said he's got power. Yeah, he does. What kind, I wonder? See, you take these dumb, stupid Christians. They think anything supernatural and miraculous of the Lord. Don't have an ounce of sense, man. Not an ounce of sense. Had a fellow, a friend of mine went down to see Captain Coleman, and he fell over in his face when he got up in front of her, and he said that was proof she was filled with the Holy Spirit because the power just knocked him down. <laughs> I wouldn't bet any money on it. Now you take this fellow here, he had his dwelling in the tombs, and no man could tame him. No man could chain him on natural strength. You take a man, if some of you women are married to demon-possessed men, and you might be, I don't deny, I don't, I don't say it's not contemporary. I don't limit what I have to say back there in the 19th centuries. If some of you married demon-possessed man, he won't respond to force, he won't respond to threat, and he won't respond to love. He won't respond, period. Got a preacher told me down in uh, at Macon, Georgia, one time, he said, well, he said, I guess that preacher wrote when he said, the same thing happened to you, what happened to my congregation. He said, they done concreted on me. <laughs> and by that, he meant you couldn't get him to do anything. You know, back in the old days, when a man was under conviction, knew he was lost, and knew he was going to hell, and knew what he ought to do to get saved, when they stood up here and started to sing, he's down there getting saved. Not anymore. They'll stand back there, mouth dry as cotton, Swell all the back of the benches, shake it at the knees, hair stand the back end of their head, weather they out, go home and watch another program. Folks watch me draw, you know what they're waiting for? They're waiting for the commercial. You get down to the invitation, the fellow sitting there says, well, that program's over, when, when the next one comes on. You know what we're developing in America? We're developing a, a, a passive nation. They sit, and they can't respond. You know what that's one of the marks of? Demon possession. You've got to get in a passive state to get them. That's where hypnosis comes in. That's where rhythm comes in. You get him in a passive state, and there's an entrance. And you're gradually getting a country, and I'm going to put a loincloth on this fellow for decency's sake in the drawing, but the Bible said he was naked. And you take uh, this country, this country is developing a passive race of people who can't respond. Uh, George Wallace is in Baltimore going out to the crowd a guy says bam 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 boom bam oh, well come on man put an end to it you mean to tell me a man full of 38 next to you and he was right next to somebody he could get off five shots before you could hit him how could he do it unless you were in a passive state you would tell you stand in the crowd, a guy pulls out a pistol right next to you, bam, whack, he won't shoot it twice. I'll guarantee you. You hit a man right there as hard as you can hit him, he ain't going to hold nothing up. The fellow pulls out a thing, bam, slap, right on the shin, man. He won't fire again. The fellow goes, bam, right in the face. You don't have to pull back, just come up from here. That's a good one, always. <laughs> just right in the teeth. <laughs> And you say, well, 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 let me ask you something. Even if the first one caught you off and the second one caught you off, you mean that bird could fire five shots before you could move? You know what we got? We got a nation of folks that are asleep, that are under a spell. And when I say nation, I'm talking in terms of million. I'm not talking in terms of 12, 14 people. Down there in Pensacola, a very good friend of mine, a doctor, eye, ear, nose, and throat man named Dr. Farrier, came down one day from his office and got his usual cup of coffee at a drugstore counter down below where he, he practiced. And he and a doctor named Dr. Anderson were sitting there and uh, drinking coffee. And a colored fellow came there and sat down next to him, reached over, picked up a fork, stabbed him right in the back of the neck. And Dr. Fire turned around and said, up, oh, and the guy stabbed him again. Missed the juggler about a half an inch. And he was standing there with blood spouting all over his shirt, saying, get that fella, get that fella, Anderson, saying, get a doctor and grab it. And that black fella got up and walked out the front of the store. They followed him out yelling, call the police, get that man, call the police. 
Two dozen people in the store, 300 outside. You think anybody did anything? Of course not. You know what they're doing? They're watching the pretty TV program. They've seen blood before. we got a generation that's soaked in blood. You've seen so much blood shed if somebody spouted blood right here. It'd take you four or five minutes to decide it wouldn't catch it. You saw, look at the blood. Yeah, I seen that before. I saw that in that program last week. <laughs> Fellow goes, they went out the door. They fought that guy on the San Carlos Hotel, yelling, get him, stop him, call the police. Nobody did anything. They have the nearest thing they got to something done. They stopped by a truck where a fellow had a radio there, a call radio to where he worked, a construction man, and they told him, phone the police, phone the police. He said, I can't. He said, this, uh, uh, wave set up here, this wavelength only reached the place where I work. And they said, well, phone the place where you work. Contact them and tell them to get the police. And he didn't do anything. They finally got down to the hotel and there was a girl in a clothing store, the rental, re- uniform rental place, and when they came up the steps, she saw it and phoned the police. Well, the color fellow got to the top of the steps, he turned around and said, you white SOB, you take another step, I'll kill both of you. Went on there, the police came down and got that fellow, took him out to the county jail, put him in the county jail, gave him something to eat. He took a spoon, shot the spoon, stabbed the white fellow in the stomach in the cell and killed him. So they sent him off to Chattahoochee, look at his brain, in two years he'll be out, next time he'll kill you. You know what we got? We got a nation of folks that can't move. Folks talk about what happened to this nation if it were attacked. Would we rally? Rally? You can't even rally at a crisis in your own neighborhood. We got a bunch of folks that are passive. You can't tame them. You can't chain them. You preach about hell. They sit there. Preach about heaven. Say something funny. Say something sad. Say something scary. <laughs> They've had it, man. They've had it. They've been scared so much and laughed so much and cried so much and been shocked so much. They're no longer shockable. They're just a blank. They're just a blank. I'll tell you, when God calls a young man the minister these days, he's got something to preach to. Boy, you stop thinking back in those old days when a man get up and preach, folks take what he said to heart to scare the tar out of them. But these days, you're preaching to a bunch of folks that are hardened criminals. Brother Smith gets up here on Sunday morning and preaches to you folks. He's preaching to folks that have seen anywhere from five to fifteen men killed in the last seven days, right in the living room. Couldn't chain him. Couldn't tame him. Down south many years ago when a a uh, train came through there, and trains were a great thing back in those days. One came through a small town out there, and somebody said, the train's coming through, and the town drunk, a big old boy about six feet seven, said, I'll go down there and take that blankety blind thing off the rails. They said, you fool, it'll mash you to a pulp. He said, don't worry about me. The train came through that afternoon, came chugging down there, you know, about 15 miles an hour like they came in those days. That big old drunk boy went out there and stood out in front of that uh train and put one foot in one rail like this and put one foot in one rail like that and flexed those old muscles and got ready and that thing came down and he grabbed that cow catcher and that old train just went over him just mashed him flat. <laughs> Deem us people have nat- unnatural strength but you can't tame them. You warn them, they don't pay attention to the warning. Just go ahead. They're blanks. They're blanks. In this ear, out this ear. Alright. No man could chain him. No man could tame him. Keep on reading. Verse 5. Verse 5, always, he was in the mountains. Well, 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 demons have an affinity for high places. I bet you didn't get that out of the movie, did you? Isn't it amazing what you get out of that little old book you can buy down at the dime store for 75 cents? Always in the mountains. Didn't you read back in the Old Testament? The high places, the high places, the high places, the high places. They worship the high places. Cut down the high places. You ever been down to Cape Canaveral? You know what they're doing? Trying to get up. You ever go to Houston Space Center? You know what they're doing? Trying to get up. Did you ever read Isaiah 14? I will ascend and put my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. I wonder who said that. How many of you know who said that? Could I see your hands? I'm glad to see a fifth of you are awake. (laughs) Uh, Affinity for high places. That is not. Take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 9. Look at verse 20. 21 and 22. Mark 9, 20, 21 and 22. You get over Mark chapter 9, look at verse 9, verse 20, 21 and 22. You know what he said about that boy that was demon-possessed? He said that boy f- fell down, wallowed, foaming, foaming. And then he says on down there in verse 22, and oft, the un- 
unclean spirit took that boy and cast that boy in the fire and water. Demons have an affinity for warm, wet places. Fire and water. Demons in that kid, heads for the fire. Demons in that kid, head for the water. You know the two things people never get tired of looking at? Fire and water. You know why folks like to buy on the side of a lake? Or a river? Or a pond? Or an ocean? They just sit there and they just look, 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 and look, and look. Did you ever see people sit around a fire out on the beach? They just look at that fire and just look at it and look at it and look at it and look at it and look at it. I wonder why that is. You know what that Bible says the final destination of unclean spirits is? A lake of fire. That's it. Sit there and just stare and stare and stare and stare. And stare. It's almost hypnotic. Isn't it? Oh, I go back there to Mark. And in Mark chapter 5, verse 3, notice it said, Always he was in the mountains, crying and cutting himself with stones. Demons seek for warm, wet places. You doubt it? You think, well, Ruckman is just talking again. Well, let's ask you Navy men. Let's ask you fellows in the Navy 30 years, the Army 20 years. Where are the worst hell holes in the world? Would you name them? You ever been to Shanghai? It's on the water. You ever been to Manila? It's on the water in the tropics. You ever been to Cairo? That's one. You been to Cairo? You ever been to Honolulu? There's one. You ever been to San Diego? You ever been to New Orleans? You ever been to Marseille? You ever been to Miami? You ever been to Baltimore on the water? St. Louis on the water? Natchez on the water? Cincinnati on the water? How many rivers come through this town? <laughs> Three. <laughs> you don't have a chance. <laughs> now you take around that place right there, those demons have an affinity for warm, wet places. They have an affinity for high places. And that isn't all. He said, always the mountain, the tombs, he was crying and cutting himself with stones. Look at it carefully. Always night and day crying. Excessive crying is a mark of demon possession. You know, you say, Rupp, before you get through, we'll all think we're all demon-possessed. <laughs> okay, cast them out. Cast, do your own exorcism. I wouldn't wait for somebody else to do it. You talk about, you talk about demonology, I've got no doubt at all, standing right here right now, I'm standing in a place that's infested with them. And there'll be more of them here after you leave. Did you ever go in an empty church building at night? I mean, you folks that just, you know, you know, just live all your life with just taxes and bills and stuff, you ought to find out what's going on. You take this meeting right here we're having right now, see? You got a bunch of temples of the Holy Spirit in here and a concentration of the Word of God and there's a, there's a push out this way, you see? On the safe fellow comes in here, he feels uneasy. It ain't his environment. <laughs> now if you're on the safe fellow and want to feel at home, tell you what you do, you come back to this service at about, this church about 11.30 at night. Come in and sit down. You'll feel something then. When God's people meet to start praising and raising up Jesus Christ, well, something goes like this. Where they leave, compresses like that. If you don't believe it, try it. All right, he says, crying and cutting himself with stones. Excessive crying is a mark of demon possession. What some psychiatrists call depression. Maniac depressive. It's not a mark of depression at all. It's a mark of demoniac possession. You know what Paul said? Listen, I would not have you sorrow as others sorrow that have no hope. A Christian may sorrow. You may cry and your face may be red with tears and puffed and swollen when you think about the death of a loved one, a bad little boy or girl. I'm not saying you shouldn't cry, but Paul says you say people shouldn't sorrow like others that have no hope. If you're saved, you've got a hope of seeing your loved ones again. You have no business blowing your eyes out day and night, day and night, year in and year out. Paul said, rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice. That's the bit. I don't care what gets you down. After all, the worst thing that can happen to you is glory.
I mean, suppose all your kids get killed tonight, and the doctor says you've got malignant cancer, you die without a cent, and a week before you die, the atom bomb goes off over the hospital, you die of fallout burns in the gutter. You know what comes next? Glory. I mean, we save people in the end. We got it made. We got it made. Excessive crying and weeping is not of the Lord. And he said, listen, cutting himself with stones. You know how a bunch of people cut themselves with stones? You ever been in the Philippines? Did you ever see them around Lent? Crawl down the street in the hands and knees? Take these whips, whip their back, blood coming off the back? Did you ever go to Spain? Did you ever watch them wear the hair shirt in Spain? They sell over $10,000 worth of whips every spring in Spain so folks can whip themselves. I wonder who'd do that. Presbyterians, I suppose. Church of God, somebody. <laughs> Uh, did you ever, did you ever read back in 1 Kings chapter 18, where the prophets of Baal leaped upon the altar and said, Oh, Baal, hear us, oh, Baal, hear us. Well, Elijah stand down there and said, Some gods you got. <laughs> Some god going to quail hunting trip in Georgia, man. Yeah, you can't wake him going to sleep. Some you got. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, he was a nice fellow, wasn't he? <laughs> How'd you like to have him for a pastor? <laughs> Somebody said, I don't believe folks ought to make fun of religion. Well, you don't know much about the Lord, do you? When God raised up his prophets, they never hesitated to ridicule the tar out of things that weren't right. Christ said to the leading religious people of his day, you Pharisees, you blind guy that straight out a map and swallow a camel, you whited suppicers, you serpents, you... Not very chat way to talk. There's some of you Christians here would leave a man like that in five minutes. You just think you love the Lord. You don't love the Lord. You love your friends and your in-laws and the world. And if it came to a choice between what that book says and what your in-laws say, you'd sell God out for 35 cents. All right, he said crying and cutting himself with stones. Mutilation. God never told you to get saved of mutilating yourself. I mean, he may have said it is better for you to enter into life halt, maimed or lame, or blind, and having two hands to be cast into hell, for the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. He might have said that, but he never said you get saved by doing it. I mean, if your eyes were keeping you from getting saved, you'd be better off without it. If your hands were keeping you from trusting Christ, you'd do better to get along without it, but cutting it off won't save you. You'd cut off both hands, you won't be saved. Crying, cutting himself with stones. Keep on reading. Verse 6. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. I hope the movie made that clear. All demon possessed people believe in the deity of Christ and they're all religious. They're all professing Christians. You never met a demon possessed person that Bible doesn't recognize that Jesus Christ is the Holy One, the Son of God. Not a one. Atheists aren't demon possessed. Because they don't have any sense. <laughs> Somebody said, Stalin's the Antichrist. He couldn't be the Antichrist. An atheist couldn't be the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a substitute God. you got to be a theist to be a devil. The devils also believe and tremble. James chapter 2. Now look at that thing there. He ran and did what? Does it say worship? Does it say worship? That's more than some of you Christians do, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. How about that? I, I trust the movie made that clear. <laughs> I trust the movie made it clear that demon possessed people worship Jesus Christ. I didn't go to see it to see if it did. I hope it did. You done wasted your money. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to go to see the movie to see if I'm telling you the truth. And if I had a German shepherd, I got a German shepherd home, but if he went to see it, I'd shoot him before he got to the front gate when he got home. <laughs> But I'll tell you right now, in that passage you're reading right there, that demon-possessed man ran and worshipped Jesus Christ. They're not atheists. They know who the Lord is, if you don't. They worshipped him, and ran and worshipped him. And then he says in verse 7, And cried with a loud voice, and said, Jesus, thou son of the Most High God, I drew thee by God, thou torment me not. Torment me not. You know that demons... Possessed people think the Lord has come to upset them? You know what people think us fundamental preachers are? I mean, us old hellfire and damnation, fire and brimstone, Bible-thumping Jesus boys. That's what we are, and I make no apologies for it. 
I read in the paper the other day where it said the new style of preaching is not an authoritative bombast, but rapping or conversing with the congregation. Well, that's too bad. I'm out of date then. And you know some us old mean, tough, crude, vulgar, uncouth fellows, you know why we talk the way we talk to you? We talk that way to try to get you to wake up and get you to think. We don't do it to torment you. I'm not here to torment you. You don't want to say people, they think us preachers have come to upset them and serve the way of living and make them miserable. I didn't come here to make you miserable. I came here to offer you Jesus Christ that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You never met a man in your life that loved the joke anymore than I love it. You never looked at a man in your life that enjoyed, I mean, just enjoyed life anymore than I enjoyed. I'd bet you if I was a betting man. But I'll tell you one thing, if I didn't warn you about a God-defying sin, and a, and a Christ-dishonoring sin, and a sin of unbelief would strike out your soul like a two-headed rattlesnake, I'd be your enemy. One time, Dr. Arnott in Philadelphia came around and knocked at the door of a widow's house, who'd been behind on her payments, they're about to shut off the gas, and went around the town. And she heard him knock, and she didn't answer the door. And he knocked again, and she didn't answer. And the next day he met her in the street and said, Widow, he said, I came around the other day. Your house knocked the door. I wanted to give you some money to help you pay your rent. And she said, Oh, is that you? She said, I thought it was the landlord coming to collect. And you know, the Holy Spirit comes and knocks at people's heart, and they think that's some mean old slave driver coming there to take away the cigarettes. Take away the liquor, take away their women, take away their men, and take away their pleasure, and take away their fun, and make them miserable. I'll tell you, brethren, God's honest truth, I've been saved nearly 26 years, and I've been happy in those 26 years with Jesus Christ, that I was happy in the first 27 years out of Christ, and I'm here to testify, it's been more fun and more joy without the things that I wanted than it was with them. He came to give you life more abundantly, not to make a slave out of you. He's going to chain you down. You don't start living till you get saved. And you start living. All right, he says a loud voice. One of the marks of being possession is a loud voice. You say, boy, you sure must have him. You're loud enough. <laughs> well, didn't you read over in Luke chapter 1? When the Lord was talking to Elizabeth and Mary, that Elizabeth spoke with a loud voice, being filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, the devil's a counterfeiter. He's an imitator. One is a mark of the Holy Spirit, counterfeit over here. You know how you tell a man by his voice and his eyes? Now listen. Out of the abundance of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. What's in here comes out here. You know why I don't say man is always saying damn this and damn that and damn the other thing? Because down here he's damned. Are they damn the airplane, damn the pilot, and damn the control tower, and damn the weather, and damn the umpire, and damn the batter, and damn the linebacker, and damn the seats? Why, when I, when I take a plane out of here tomorrow and get on there, the first thing I do is ask God to take all the dams off it. I mean, really? I don't want to ride the plane curse like that. It might crash. <laughs> How do you know all the car wrecks out there in the road aren't answers to prayer? I'm going to start look at that blankety-blank car coming on the blank-to-blank highway, all that kind of business. You know why an unsaved man says damn and says hell? Because he's damned to hell, that's why. What's down here comes out here. You know how you tell a man? By his eyes. The eyes, the window of the soul. Demon-possessed people have two kinds of eyes. One kind pops like this. They pop. The other kind droops like this. It looks like they're half asleep. Now, I'm not talking about some of you folks kind of tired right now. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about a constant thing, see? Well, the eyelid kind of hangs down like that all the time. When they talk to you, they don't look in your eyes. They look at your nose. I say, well, Brother Ruckman, I know you think you're right. You're doing the best you can, brother. But I just want to have you know, za, 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 za. What's that, man? What's that monotone? Where'd you get that voice from? That isn't the Lord. Years ago, they had a fellow on television. They're always getting prizes for being the best religious telecast. And he got up and drew some things like I do, you know, who around the chalkboard, you know, and he talked. And somebody said, he had such magnetic eyes. Yes, he did. <laughs> he did. Did you ever see the eyes of a snake in the tide in this world? Shows up in the eyes, shows up in the voice, 
He showed me there was a certain kind of preacher that if he were to stand right behind me now and start preaching, I could tell you what church he was from, and I'd never have to even ask him. By the tone of his voice. Isn't that weird? Listen, people. When God saved Matthew, he did not write like Paul. Paul's writings are not like Matthew. Matthew doesn't write like David. David doesn't write like Simon Peter. When God saves a man, he does overpower him, turn him into a passive ottoman, and then elect his will for him, and take the place of his personality, and make him come out as a rubber stamp like the last 15 guys that believe that junk. When God saves a man, God takes what he has and sanctifies it for his glory, and takes what that man has and uses it. Did you know, basically, you still have the same, same characteristics you had before you were saved? Now, I know if any man is new in Christ, a new creature, old things have passed away, all things have become new. That, was, that context talking about spiritual things. What's wrong about your body? Don't tell me you have four hands after you're saved. You had two before you were saved, you still got them. Some of you fellows had a temper before you got saved. You still got it. Just don't lose it. I mean, before you were saved, didn't some of you like ice tea? You couldn't like it when you got saved? See, I knew what the Lord would do. You take what you have and if you surrender to him, he'll use it, but he don't make me like it. Brother Smith? And don't make Brother Smith a carbon copy of all Roberts, and don't make all Roberts a, core, uh, a carbon copy of Billy Graham. There's a guy preaching for Billy Graham right now that you couldn't tell it wasn't Billy Graham. Lord, ain't the author of that kind of business. If I heard a fellow right back here right now say, and so we see that the Bible says we should repent and be baptized, for we read in Acts 2 and 38, and read in Mark 16 and 16, that he that believeth and is baptized shall... <laughs> Oh, man. I, I know across this country 2,000 preachers that talk just like that, and they're from 48 different states and trained by different men. They have the same diction, the same inflection, the same enunciation, the same pronunciation, the same breathing, and the same look on their face when they preach. They're controlled by one spirit, and I'll guarantee it's not the Holy Ghost. you got to watch that business. God doesn't make a fellow, you know, just, you know, just be crazy. I mean, God not the author of confusion. Some guy up there and say, and so my friends, uh, bless God, uh, we see, and uh, yes, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost, uh, okay. You know why I keep saying, uh, cause he hadn't prepared his message. Can't you figure that out? And so, uh, uh bless God, uh, he came. I heard a fellow down in, in, uh, Barksy, Mississippi preaching. His name is J. Charles Jessup. They finally got him for, uh, extortion through the mail to raise money to go to Palestine. And that old boy, he raised a couple of hundred thousand dollars or something to go to Palestine, never went. But he had a tape recording of him being in Christ's tomb in Gethsemane. And I heard him the night that thing came on. You never you never heard such smalls in all your life. That guy, I could hear him say, Oh, friends, as I kneel here in this sacred spot, and he's voice kind of echo in kind of a support real hollow sound to it, you know, as I kneel in the sacred spot. And think how my Savior was buried here. Oh, friends, you know, he was making the tape in his basement. <laughs> I heard that guy get on the radio one night, he came down there and he said, And I saw my friend, the bus guy, but I know this was up on the, on the mountain, and he, hey, boy, the bus guy, he came down uh, with the Ten Commandments, and uh, someday, my friends, uh, we're going to be judging. Uh, all my friends, I see uh, our time is up until the same time next week. This is J. Charles Jessup of Gulfport, Mississippi. <laughs> that guy just went, oh, 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 Now listen, God don't leave folks to do that. Lord ain't going to do that. You know, somehow with that voice, something peculiar there, it's not coming through. You know, back in the early days after I got saved, we had a prayer shack behind my trailer at school, and we met there, and we had us in prayer meetings. I mean, we had us in prayer meetings. Back in those days, I wanted everything God had for me. I was trying to get tongues, you know, and healing and everything else. And they put the hands on me, you know, and we tried to talk in tongues and hang on and let go and all this and that. And we get back here in that place, you know, and we all get praying at the same time, get that old prayer shack rock, and we had some good prayer meetings. And I remember one night, we were all praying at one time together, and I just quit praying for a minute, and got listening, which I shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> and I heard one guy climbing another guy's prayer. One guy was praying, 
Lord, take us out this week from the street, wash us the blood and filth the Holy Ghost and give us souls. And right behind him, this guy was praying, and Lord, take us out in the street this week and wash us in the blood and fill us the Holy Ghost and give us souls. Verbatim. I listened to that thing for a couple of minutes. I went back to pray, and after the prayer meeting was over, I followed this kid on up the sidewalk there and stopped him and uh, said, uh, listen, I said, uh, Jim, I said, uh, I may be wrong. I said, God, forgive me if I'm wrong in judging you. Pray for me, brother. But I said, this seems to me like <laughs> some of your prayer life just it ain't coming through. Something wrong. And Jim dropped his head and said, well, you're right. I'm not right with the Lord and confessed a very uh, touchy thing, you know, quite a story about it, pretty rough. And so I had to pray with him and left. And about a week later, he came back to that prayer shack. Oh, glory to God, hallelujah, bless the Lord, all that business. And, uh, boy, saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, and this evidence, and all that. And fellowship with God, boy, and back in there, let's get to praying, brother. And we got back in there and got praying. One that little prayer shack in the dark, not a light in there, all this crowded in together. I heard him follow the guy's prayer again. This guy was saying, and, oh, Lord, we pray that you'll bless us, and, Lord, we pray that you'll bless us, and you'll provide our need, and you'll provide our need. And about that time in the dark, a hand reached out there in the dark and touched me in the knee, laid across my knee in the dark. I, that happened once when I was about ten years old in the theater. And uh, I wasn't raised, as you probably know. I was a drug up. <laughs> I was turned loose and just came up natural, you know, a, a self-made man, a perfect example of unskilled labor. <laughs> And I was in this, I was in this theater, and I was about ten years old, and a man about forty years old came in there, reached out there, put his hand on my knee, and I got up in that theater and said, oh, sure! <laughs> got rid of him, boy, he took off. <laughs> and then that dark place there, I felt this hand reach out there and touch my knee in the dark, and I put my finger right up in the dark, one inch of my kid's face in the dark, and I said, you unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of it. And you know something? It would have been funny if it wasn't so awful. But that guy prayed just like this, and I'm not overdressing it. He said, Lord, take us out this week and fill us the Holy Spirit and give us souls we pray that we might do your will. That's right. You know what that fellow was? He was a born-again, saved, Bible-believing, separated, soul and Baptist. Folks say, well, I think the devil, I don't know what you think about it. But all the contacts I've had with this thing have been in Christian work. I recall another case in a certain dispute with a Christian. And that Christian said to me, said uh, something, and I said something back, and they all off and slammed me right in the face. And I turned my cheek and said, try the other side. And they hit the other side, and I said, see there, i got more religion on one side of my face, you got both sides of yours. And they said, damn you. Damn you. And I put my finger out right in front of the face and said, You unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out! And that person hit the floor. I mean, just dropped like a sack. You don't mess around with it like they do in the movies. If you ever up, get up against it, just come in right close with your eyeball right there and that eyeball right there and put up that finger and take that name that's above every name and put it on them. And if I don't work, well, I have nothing you do anyway. <laughs> I say, folks, you know, folks, uh, folks worry about, folks worry about UFOs. What well, those people getting those UFOs? I think they do. I mean, I, I buy a lot of that stuff, you know. I think of folks getting the UFOs, you know what surprises me? The biggest surprise me is never, none of them ever know enough Bible to even try something. Now, let me give you some good advice if you ever get kidnapped in a UFO. <laughs> I mean, if they ever take you for board like they did Shermer up there in Nebraska, those two boys down in Pascagoula, where do you get up? Try that one. Those fellows never tried it. You try it, okay? Let's have a little courage, brethren. Let's have a little morale. I mean, if they take you on there, put your finger right up in one of those birds' face, whatever it is, and say, you unclean spirit, by the blood of Jesus Christ, the name of God's Son, come out! And watch what happens. You might make an electronic contact you wouldn't think you had. <laughs> All right, come on down there, verse 9. And he says in verse 9, what is thy name? And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Ain't that weird? Look at that. My name, singular, is Legion, for 
we, plural, are many. Isn't that strange? Do you know that demon-possessed people are true schizos, true schizophrenia? Not just uh, good and bad side, everybody's got that. Not just old and new nature, every Christian has that. But genuinely more than one person inside, and it'll change over. They'll say schizo, they'll say paranoia. They've got a joke about two schizos going up in an elevator to talk to a psychiatrist. One of them says, I'm being a little bit schizo today. And the other one says, that makes four of us. <laughs> but you know, those things, are, those things are too funny if you have to live with them. I mean, that, that changeover, see, from one to the other. He says, we, he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. That fellow isn't just one man. He's a number of men. He's a number of men. All right. Uh, I said to a fellow one time on Pentecostal floor, I said, I'll tell him what I'm going to do now. I said, I'm going to take you to church tonight to a revival meeting. This was a young student that came down from Cincinnati, Ohio. And I said, I'm going to take you to a revival meeting tonight. And I said, in this revival meeting tonight, there's a demon-possessed woman in this church. When you see her, tell me where she is. This kid came to church about this big, packed by like this one is tonight. Never been to Pensacola before. Never been to church before. I didn't give him a hint. Came out in the back. He got looking around like this, and he said, the third one in the back row in the choir. That was the one. That one was an unsaved woman. She was a great church worker. The strange thing is, I trust they showed you that in the movie. If you wasted money, go to the movie. I trust they showed you that demon possessed people believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ and worship Jesus Christ. I hope they showed you that. If they didn't, they sold you short. That's the Bible revelation. All right, come on down to verse 11, 12, and 13. In 11, 12, and 13, there was nine of the place, a great herd of swine feeding. And all the demons besought him that they'd go out and go into the swine. Because he commanded, come out, you unclean spirit. He only commanded them once to come out. But when he commanded to come out, then that bunch on the way out said, don't send us out in the country, send us into the swine. That's a strange thing. I wonder what swine were doing up there in Palestine. Isn't pork unclean meat for a Jew? Orthodox Jew? What are they doing raising pigs up there? And he said, uh, send us into the swine. And forthwith he gave them lead. Keep on reading down to verse 13. And the whole herd ran finally down a steep place into the sea. And they were drowned, choked in the sea. About 2,000 of them. Old preacher down in Alabama said they done committed homicide. <laughs> I heard another preacher say that's the first case of deviled ham in the Bible. <laughs> and I don't know why... I don't know why uh, in the world uh, demons would seek to go into dead bodies, but the passage there said they went into bodies of swine, and the swine went down right in the water, just like the demon-possessed boy in Mark chapter 9, off time is fell in the fire and water. That's food for thought. I wonder what a demon likes about a dead body. I, mean, I don't count myself superstitious. But I wouldn't go out in the graveyard and stand there at night, you know, and defy God. Even if I was an unsaved man. Even an unsaved man, there's certain things I just wouldn't try. If you're a real tough, rough, tough, mean fella and don't believe in God and don't believe in this, try that one or something like that. Go out in the graveyard at night. About 12 o'clock at night, stand on the grave and tell God how you feel about things. You understand, I'm not superstitious, see. But isn't it strange that Bible says those demons just soon be in the dead body as a live body? Doesn't that strike you as kind of peculiar? They went in those swine instead of staying in the swine, or went down there and drowned, got down back in the water. Back in the water. That's peculiar. I don't understand all that, but I know it's so. And I know something else. I know unsaved men are likened to dogs in Second Peter chapter two twenty two, and unsaved women, Second Peter chapter two twenty two, are likened to pigs. That Bible says over there in Second Peter chapter two verse twenty two, the dog has returned to his vomit, and the sow that was washed to her, her female, her wallowing in the mire. Now, of all the animals that God ever could have used to liken an unsaved woman to, he used a pig. I don't guess that's very flattering. I mean, of all the animals he could have picked, he picked that. 
And ladies, I mean, in, the, in the terrible, humiliating thought, I'm the standpoint of negative criticism, and the Bible is a critic, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Isn't it a humiliating thought to think that if the devil had to abandon you, his next best choice would be a pig? That's rough, isn't it? I mean, you take you men here. If some devils have to go out of you and some demons have to go out, you know what the next sec- second preference is? The dirtiest animal that ever lived. That's why they're called unclean spirits. Unclean spirits. I wonder what America is like after watching X-rated movies for 20 years. What do they call them now? PG? Pretty gross. <laughs> you, know, you know, or R, revolting. <laughs> I mean, what you going to do with a nation that's just been looking at playboy and playgirl and nude women and nude men and lesbians and homos and fruits and queers and ex-movies and pornography and fornication for 30 years? Don't you know we're infested, boy? You know what I do at night before I go to bed? Now, I may you think it's kind of superstitious, but it's free country. I mean, you probably got your peculiar ways, too. I mean, I'll just kneel down beside the bed and ask God to get them out of me. And say, you unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out. I don't take a chance on it. I don't have to call you in to do the job. I'll do my own. I've got the name. I've got the title deed. I've got the name for authority. Better keep clean. Or if they went out there and those hogs went down the steep place in the sea and were choked in the sea. Come on down to verse 14. Those that fed the swine fled and went into the city to tell them what was done. And they came out to see. And they came out to see. And boy, don't you know that was something to see. Come on down verse 14. When they came down in verse 14 and verse 15, verse 15, they saw he that had been possessed with the devil sitting at the feet of Jesus, and he was clothed and in his right mind. Do you see that word clothed? Clothed. You know all the marks of demon possession? Taking off your clothes. Young men standing around, you know. You know. <laughs> oh boy, stand in front of a mirror. <laughs> Maggot food. <laughs> you know the first thing God teaches a man when he gets saved? Teaches him to put clothes on, not take them off. You know the first thing God did when he drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden? He made aprons for them. Coats of skin to cover the nakedness. Now, I know some of you have a hard time understanding. I'm in the dirty, filthy environment you live in. The dirty, filthy folks you hang out with some of you. And the dirty, filthy literature you got in your front room. The dirty stuff you watch out all night. You couldn't understand what I'm going to say. But I'll tell you a darn truth. When I got saved in March the 14th, 1949, I remember the first shower I took after I got saved. And it just didn't look quite the same. Man, what you talking about? You think an artist don't know anatomy? You think a man that's lifeguarded in the beaches in Delaware for four summers doesn't know how bodies put together? I remember when after I got saved and got a shower and got looking down at that old skin, that old flesh, something began to get through my mind, boy. Paul said, we are those that rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You see what that thing is right there? It's a corpse. Watch it move. The motions of sin by the law working in my members. You see what that thing is there? It's a dead man. See it move? And the Bible says that body is nailed to the cross. It's dead. I'm crucified with Christ. Reckon yourself dead, dead, dead. I want to say man is spiritually dead. And a Christian is spiritually alive and is physically dead. You see that thing right there? If the Lord don't come, that's going to drag me down to the grave. That's a dead man. I better have him strut it and show it off too much. You know what this thing is that I have in my hand? It's a piece of burnt wood. You see this thing using it? It's a piece of burnt wood. You know what the Lord Lord said to Zechariah? Is not this a brand plucked from the burning? A brand plucked from the burning is a piece of burnt wood. Better hadn't go in it too much. All right, sitting, 
clothe the feet of Jesus and in his right mind. You know, when a fellow gets saved, he just starts to think right. And about the time he starts to think right, people think he's crazy. And if you live for the devil after you get saved, folks call you hypocrite. And if you live for the Lord, folks will say you're a fanatic and you can't win. But I'll tell you, when a man gets saved, he starts thinking straight. No man has a sound mind of God control the mind. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy what? Mind. Paul said, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. I know the world thinks we're crazy. That's all right. Feeling is mutual. We think they're crazy. They expect us, you know, to believe in the Stegosaurus and Triceratops and Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archeozoic. They expect us to believe it took 15 million years or 50 million years for this mess to get here and gradually a part of a dust cloud. And then they, then they tell us we're crazy for believing in heaven and hell. My, my, my. For so sitting there at his feet, cold, sitting, resting in Christ and his right mind. You ever worry about losing your mind? Now that's a natural thing to worry about. <laughs> The devil pulled on a Christian, you think he's going to go stark raving mad, wind up the booby hatch. You know what the quote and the devil gives you that? Give him the word. God hath not given us a spirit of fear. If you've got a spirit of fear, I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. I'm afraid he can't hold out. I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell. I'm afraid I'm going to miss heaven. I'm afraid of, that isn't the Lord. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. I had a meeting with a, a pastor one time whose wife was always worried about salvation. And she'd been saved for years and always worrying about losing it. That's some hyper Calvinist come up there, you know, talking them all out of the salvation, convince them if they didn't repent like he repented, didn't cry like he cried, didn't repent, weep like he wept. They weren't really saved, you know, that old jazz. And that woman, every time an evangelist would come in that church, you know, she'd go to him and talk about how she died of salvation, didn't know she was saved, and he'd try to give her assurance and she couldn't get any assurance, and that thing went on and on. It was kind of a, Kind of a hindrance to the pastor and his work, you know. He was a good saved man, loved the Lord, knew he was saved, taught eternal security. And I was sitting around a table talking with him one time, and I said to the fellow's wife, I said, now, let me ask you something. I said, if you died right this minute, where would you go? She said, I'm afraid I'd go to hell. I said, you don't want to go to hell, do you? She said, no, 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 I don't want to go to hell. I said, what are you counting on keeping you out? And she said, well, I don't believe I'm trusting the right thing. I said, what are you trusting? And she said, well, Brother Ruckman, she said, I know what the answer to that question is, but I don't believe the answer. And I said, well, okay, tell me what you're trusting. She said, yeah, but Brother Ruckman, I know what I'm supposed to say. I said, don't say that. <laughs> tell me what you're actually trusting. You don't want to go to hell, amen? All right. What are you trusting keeping you out? You trusting something? And she said, well, she said, the blood of Jesus Christ. And I shook my head and I said, I got bad news to you, sister. She said, what? I said, you got to go to heaven and nothing to do about it. <laughs> That's right, man. I'll tell you, if you're crossing the finished blood atonement of Jesus Christ, can't get you to heaven, nothing can get you there. The fellow said to me one time, he said, did you ever doubt your salvation? Yeah, I doubted it. I, I doubted my salvation about two times in 26 years. Each time for about 20 seconds. You say, well, how'd you overcome it? Well, I just don't argue with the devil. When he tells me you're lost, I say, okay, so what? Nothing I can do about it. Forget it. <laughs> you say, well, I don't understand that reason. Well, look at here. I've trusted Christ to save me. I'm trusting his blood to save me. If that can't do it, well, why worry about it? Look at here. I did what God told me to do. He told me to receive him and believe on him and trust him. I've done it. Now, you think I'm going to sweat the rest of it out? Listen, brother, if that can't save me, I ain't going to waste my time on anything. I'm just going to hell the door shut, so forget it. <laughs> I say, you know what, you know what the, you, the trouble, you know how the devil gets folks? He gets them thinking, well, I'm lost, so i got to do something. And then he gets you looking for what you're doing to try to get you out of it. That's a trap. Don't ever trust what you're doing. You trust what Christ did for you. Or sitting, clothe the feet of Jesus in his right mind. Keep on reading. And come down there to verse uh, 17. And in verse 17, they began to pray for him to depart out of their coast. Isn't that something? 
Our old boy got saved and got right, and he was sitting down there at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and said that bunch of folks are wanting to have Jesus stay around and help them out and get the rest of them saved, fix up their homes and families. They began to pray for him to depart out of their coats. They, they were the ones that had an unsound mind. Not him. You know, God got the author of confusion. A Christian may do some wild things and crazy things once in a while, but he, Lord, can keep them on balance. And you get these little hobby horses, folks get tied up with these little unbalanced things. They come from, listen, the devil. There's a demon in there. A fellow came to me one time at school, and he said, Brother Ruffman, he said, you turned me into administration. I said, that's right, I did. I said, I understood it right. Has any of us knew anything that was going on here that wasn't according to the word of God and uh, right and done undercover? We were to turn, turn them in. I turned you in. I did turn you in. And this kid said, well, uh, Brother Ruffman, I just want to have you know that uh, I know you think you're right, but, Brother, I love you in the Lord, and I'm praying for you, and I hope that I am one of the elect. And I said, don't you know you're one of the elect? The Bible says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. And he said, well, I, I hope I'm one of the elect. And I said, Chet, if I was standing where you were standing, knowing about hell, what I know about hell, I wouldn't stand here be standing here talking to you. I said, I'd be back there in a closet getting saved. And I wouldn't come out of the closet till I knew I was saved. I might slip on a banana peel. And he said, well, I know you think you're right, brother, and I'm praying for you. I hope I am one of the elect. That isn't a sign on mine. That isn't the work of the Lord. I got a good friend over in Philadelphia named Alex Dunlap. He uh, has a home for converted nuns and priests. You talk about a ministry, he's got one. And he had a meeting in the Methodist church one time recently up there in Philadelphia. And just about the time he got ready to preach, the piano player began to spin around the stool, you know. And hostile to Shondai, always have Shondai in it, whatever that means. Might be a cuss word. And to spin around the hostile to Shondai, who so I so little blue, little blue, little blue, American, you know. And when he got through with that, he done that, you know, with that pastor and said, she's unscriptural. <laughs> And the pastor said, why? And Dunlap said, no interpreter. Where's the interpreter? And the pastor said, I'm the interpreter. <laughs> and Dunlap said, what's she say? <laughs> and the pastor said, she said there's going to be trouble in this church. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, what a prophecy, man. <laughs> and uh, Dunlap turned to the pastor and said, well, you know something? He said, I've got a gift, too. And he said, what's that? And he said, I've got the gift of prophecy. i tell you what kind of trouble it's going to be. <laughs> and he went over there and bent down that woman and said, yep, 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 said something to her. Went back and the meeting went on and she never opened her yap again. And uh, the after the service over the pastor said, what did you tell her? And Dunlap said, I told her I have the gift of prophecy and I could tell her what kind of trouble it's going to be. And the trouble it's going to be was if she didn't shut up and quit that foolishness, there wasn't going to be any meeting. I was leaving. <laughs> Now, you know, the trouble some folks, they just don't use good sense. Alex Dunlap went to a full gospel fellowship Christian business meeting where they're talking about the tongue and the healing and all this and that. And I had a priest up there, and he was talking about how he could raise dead people and heal folks. And when he got through, he said, any ask you like to have me heal you and pray for healing? Alex got up and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm, I'm getting bald. He said, I'm just about bald. He said, uh, would you give me some hair? <laughs> And the priest said, uh, yes, remember that in prayer. And he started turning away. And Alex said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, now. You said you raised a dead fellow. Give me some hair. You can give me some hair, can't you? There were 40 businessmen sitting around. And the priest said, well, uh, is there any other requests? And Alex said, my hair, my hair, my hair, my hair. <laughs> you know, you got a lot of pious fraud in this country that don't like you to enjoy that. They don't want to have you, they think that's being really irreverent, real blasphemous, you laugh like that. Let me tell you something, that book says in Revelation chapter 2 verse 3, it says, Thou hast tried them that say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. Don't take it too seriously, some of that business. I mean, try the spirits. I'm not saying it's all the devil, but you better try the spirits. Clothed in his right mind. Or right, they begin to pray for him to depart out of their coats. Isn't that something? I think that's one of the strangest things in the Word of God. I mean, if Jesus Christ came and fixed up your husband like he fixed up that man, if he ever was a family man, or fixed up the countryside so your children could go through it at night without getting cut, without getting flailed to death with a chain, wouldn't you have been thankful? 
Wouldn't you thought those folks said, Jesus, it sure is wonderful to have you around. We can go through the cut canal at night without fear, and our boys and girls can play out in this hillside without worrying about getting mutilated by some masochist or sadist. Wouldn't you thought they'd said, stay around, Jesus, and help us out and get our homes right and get our families right? And that bunch, they came out there and they looked out there and said, where are them pigs? The guy said, they ran down the hill and got drowned. How many head? Two thousand. Two thousand. Two thousand head, pork, dollar, pound, system, system, pound, system, system, system. They said, this cost us money. You've got to get out of here. Do you know if you folks are going to do something here at this Baptist temple, it's going to cost you some money? You want to clean up the area around here where it's safe? You want to raise a bunch of kids that can be disciplined do something? It's going to cost you something. You want to have a place clean up, raise a generation of young people, believe something, and stand for something? You ain't going to do it for nothing. In any way in the world. And if you're not willing to pay the price, forget it. Forget it. You know what I think sometimes? I think sometimes God the Holy Spirit has been hovering over America ever since the days of Billy Sunday, wanting to give our country a revival. We haven't had a real revival in the sense of real revival since the days of Billy Sunday, and you better believe it. We're not having a real revival under Billy Graham. We're not having a real revival of these charismatic people and Jesus freaks and children of God people. There's no real revival going on. You don't find liquor stores closing. One or two owners get converted here and there might shut them up. You can't shut the whole bunch of them up. You don't close down your adult movies. They're operating full blast. You don't clean up Watergate at the politicians. They're all just crooked at one another. Nixon got caught, the rest of them didn't. So what? I'm in that kind of business. Why, listen, back in this country when those guys like Billy Sonny and Sam Jones preached, when they left the town, the theaters were closed and the jails were empty and the liquor stores were shut. You know what I think? I think the Holy Spirit's been hovering over this country for years and years saying, you want revival? You want revival? We've been saying, yes, Lord, send us revival. And the Holy Spirit's been saying, all right, if you're going to have revival, then this has to go, and that has to go, and this has to go, and that has to go. You know what Americans have been doing? They've been looking God in the face. They've been looking God Almighty straight in the face, and they've been saying, Lord, we can't live without this. We can't live without that. We've got to have this. We've got to have that. And the Lord's been looking at America and saying, listen, if you want revival, either that goes or I go. And Americans have been saying, bye-bye. And the Holy Spirit's been going on down the road. I mean, I'm, I'm almost certain that's what it is. Now, you take down south. I don't know where, how it is up here, up north. But down south, Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi, we have what they call simultaneous revivals. And every spring, around March, April, and May, down south, there are hundreds. That's an understatement. There are thousands. There are thousands of Baptist churches in the south where everybody's praying. When those simultaneous revivals come through, they bring in the evangelist, bring in the song leader, and put on a revival effort. And down south, they're literally, every spring, every spring the last 40 years, there have been literally thousands of churches down south where people have been praying, Lord, send us revival. Pray around the clock, special prayer seasons. Lord, send us revival, send us revival, send us revival, and no revival. What's the trouble? What's the trouble? Well, listen, back there at the Fulton Street, old Dutch uh, uh, Reformed Church in Fulton Street, back there around 1810, 12 people met and got a prayer meeting going that shook the whole eastern seaboard and put about 150,000 people in the kingdom of God. Now, how do you explain 400,000 Bible-believing Baptists on their knees praying, Lord, send us revival, send us revival, send us revival, and no revival? Well, I can only find one solution. I think the Holy Spirit broods over America and says, I want to do something for you. I want to do something for you. I want to do something for you. But if I do, that's got to go. That record. That one right there. And those magazines, out. And this stuff on the boob tube, out. And Americans looking God in the face and saying, I just can't live without it then you'll have to live without revival. You know, I always enjoy being in a meeting with Lester Roloff. We always have a big time together. We're completely different. But we both believe in sacking everything. <laughs> a lady came out A lady came out of a, a, a Bible conference we had one time with Bob Gray. At the end of the service, she came out after a week, and she said, Brother Rutten, this is terrible. This is terrible. This is just terrible. I said, what's terrible? She said, you've taken all our versions from us. 
You've taken our television from us. You've taken our magazines and newspapers. Brother Olaf has taken our tea and taken our coffee and taken our pork and taken our Coca-Colas. We haven't got anything left. <laughs> I said, you got God. That ain't bad. You got the Lord left. You got the book left. It could be worse. I was talking with Dallas Billingham one time, just before he died. Matter of fact, the summer before he died. That old soldier of the cross up at a camp up there in Baptist Acres, and I was talking with him about some things. I sat on the table with him, and I said, Now, Dr. Billingham, I said, You're an old-timer. Now, he's an old hill boy from Kentucky, came through 1890, 1880. And I said, You've been around a long time. I said, I, I want you to just tell me. I mean, I, I like to talk to older men. I always have liked to talk to fellas in their 60s, 70s, 80s. I, I feel they know something. This bunch of 30 hadn't been through enough to, you know, know what's going on. And I said to the old man, I said, now you've been around here for over a half a century. I said, let me ask you something. If you would just, would you just tell me in one line, just briefly, why we haven't had a revival in America? And I said, no, there's a lot of reasons, but you, could you just boil it down in one sentence? And that old man said, we have too much. And I said, what? He said, back in the old days, that if a man could preach, folks would come from miles around to hear him preach. So if a man was a real preacher, I'm going to say people come by the hundred to sit there for weeks at a time to hear him preach. But he said, now everybody got an entertainment center in the front room and the best talent from Hollywood and Chicago and New York. And he said, we've got campers and boats and trailers and all this stuff. We got too much. He said, I don't think we'll ever have a revival in America again until we have another depression. What he said. I don't like that. I was raised in the depression. I know what it was like. Boy, I ate so much oatmeal for breakfast, <laughs> I ought to turn into a horse, man. <laughs> Back here in the Depression, we had nothing to play with. Nobody had any money. A millionaire told me, he said, that first Depression, nobody had any money, but they had food. He said, when the next come one comes through, everybody's going to have money and nobody's going to have food. But I mean, I was, we go out and play football or baseball. Oh, I'll get back to this in a minute. But you take my boys, the boy little leakers, you know, in high school, this and that. They want these shoulder pads and the wristbands, you know, and this $18 ball glove and this, you know, Johnny Bench bat and all this stuff. A little old kid, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. He don't have to have a $100 worth of equipment. And back when I came up, we had no equipment, man, nothing. We go out there and play football. A football would get punctured. You couldn't pump it up again. Nobody had a pump. We cut them open and stuff rags in them. You ought to see those punts. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> they go up in the air. Why, these kids, you got to have sandbags for bases. We had trees for bases. Boy, you slid into them. You really felt it. <laughs> when I was a boy in, in that depression, we had nothing to play. You had to make your toys. I tell my kid, go out and find something to do. Go out and there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. We found something to do. I would go out there and play hide the seek. Never could find me, I'd hide in the garbage can. <laughs> well, yeah, one of those boys said, one of those boys, he said, uh, he said, I was ugly and play hide the seek, nobody even come and look for me. <laughs> and we used to take wood, we whittle wood down, make a little thing we call a peewee. A little piece of wood like this and was whittled off on the ends. Then you put that thing down the ground, hit it with a thing like a hockey stick and bounce up there and then you'd club it. And snowball fights with uh, garbage can lid and all that, you know, and take green apples and throw them over a roof with all that kind of business. We had to do this because nobody had any money. And I'll tell you, I don't look forward to another depression. I hope it don't ever come. But if that's what it takes to bring revival, I don't know, man. I don't know. All right, finish it up. And he comes out there and down the end of that chapter, he says in verse 19 and verse 20, that same fellow came to Jesus and said, let me go with you in the ship. And Jesus suffered him not. But he said, go your way and go home to your friends and tell your friends and your family how great things the Lord hath done for thee. And the Bible says that at the end of the passage in verse 20, he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things the Lord had done for him. And all men did marvel. And I bet they did. I mean, if I hope was a married man, can't you see his homecoming? Don't you, can't you see that bird come back to his house and knock on the door? The little ten-year-old boy pokes out the door, head out the door and says, It's day, run for your life. And everybody, back in the back of the room, shut the door, slam the doors, you know. 
Old man come there and stand in the living room a while, and he'd look out through a crack in the door at him, and his wife says, he got clothes on for change. What will happen to him? Well, I've seen it before. Always said he's going to get right every time. You know, he'll be back in a bottle in a while. And about that time, the little six-year-old boy comes out there and says, that's you, Daddy? And the old man standing there, tears running out of his face, and says, kids, I just brought you home a Christian daddy. Boy, don't you know we had a hard time convincing them? All men did marvel. You know, it's a wonderful thing when a full-grown, demon-possessed man gets right with the Lord. You don't see enough of it. Back in the days of 1910 to 1930, all the fellows getting saved were grown men. And from 1930 to 1960, they were all high school kids. And now they're all grade school and under. Something's happened to this country. Now, I'm not believing that. I mean, I praise God. A kid gets saved four, five, six, seven years old. Thank God he got a whole life saved as well as a soul. Praise the Lord. But I'm the old school, you know. I guess you could gather that by now. I like to see those old boys, 40 and 50, come down there balling and clean up their lives, man, and get right. My, my, that's a blessing. You just don't see enough of it. I had a meeting one time up in Sparkburg, South Carolina, and I went by the jail that morning to preach. Went by the jail and preached, and that morning in jail, a couple of fellows got saved. One fellow I preached to didn't pay attention to me at all. He was a big old toy-headed kid, about 25 years old. He lay up there in that top bunk. When I came, he looked at me, he went, Hoof, lay down and put the funny paper over his face. I finished preaching, went on about my business. About the next week, I was down in Greenville, South Carolina at night, walking up down the streets, passing out tracks. Time came to come home, and some of my friends took me back to the car. They said, this fellow back here says he knows you. And I said, who is he? He said, oh no, say his name is Whitey Woods. And I said, I never heard of him. We got back to the car, and here they have this big old toe-headed bum. The fellow's been in jail, and he was a little bit drunk. And when I came up, he said, hello, our preacher, how are you doing? I said, okay, you're not doing so good, are you? And Whitey said, no, I ain't, preacher. But said, my mom was a Christian, my daddy's a Christian, I was raised right. He said, I want to apologize to you for how I acted in jail the other day, so I should have listened to you. He said, but I just didn't have good manners. And I said, well, that's okay, forget it. I said, what do you want us to do for you? He said, I want to run down to the mission. And I said, well, you're drunk. They won't let you in the mission down there drunk. And he said, well, I'm sober enough to know what I'm doing. I said, we'll try it. So we got him in the car. Would you come on down to the mission? Me on one side, another kid on the other, two fellows driving up in front, three of them praying, me dealing with them. Or you get one of them cars, just like getting in a hornet's nest. <laughs> and all three of those fellows praying, I got dealing with Whitey Woods. He wouldn't say nothing. Man, he was tight-lipped. And I kept talking about Christ, about getting saved, and he talked about his Christian mother, mentioned her Christian father up there in the hills of Carolina. That's about all he'd say. And finally, I said, well, Whitey, I said, why don't you get saved? And he said, well, maybe a better hand. So he bowed his head there in the back seat and prayed and asked the Lord to save him, put him with the Spirit. Didn't seem to get much from it. He quit, said amen, went on. Got down there at the mission, tried to get him in, they wouldn't let him in. Came back to the car and sat down next to him and I said, well, I said, I got a place out in the trailer court behind my trailer where you can sleep. You don't mind sleeping outdoors. He said, okay, thank you. We started driving up back to the trailer court about 15 miles. That old fellow sat there, shoulders wide as a barn door, sat there between us and all of a sudden he went, <laughs> Like that. I thought, man, he's losing his marbles, you know what he <laughs> Like that. And I turned to him, I said, what's the matter? And he said, oh, preacher, I think it took. <laughs> and brother, I thought opened his mouth, you couldn't shut him up for 15 miles. He talked like a woman of a sewing circle. That guy talking about his mom and his dad and his past and the jail sentence and this and that. And that old boy had assurance of salvation just as cold and sober as any man in that car. We got out there at the trailer court, and I said, Now, why do you have to tell him what I'm going to do? You can see about and back, and he said, Well, I'm going to get up early in the morning and go back to Carolina and tell my mom I got saved. And I said, Well, good. I said, I'll give you a Bible. Take it back with you. And he said, Good. Took the Bible, took him out back, gave him a pilot out there and a flashlight, the blanket, and the Bible. And I knew if he was lying, you know, he'd steal the flashlight and the body and the blanket next morning. <laughs> And uh, I started to leave him, and I said to Whitey before I left, I said, uh, now you go back and witness your mom and daddy and tell them you got saved. And, uh, don't worry about that, get through in the morning, leave the blanket and the flashlight here. He said, I'll do it, preacher. And I started back to the house, he turned to me and he said, uh, how do you talk to God, preacher? 
said, well, you pray. He said, well, show me how. How do you do it? I said, well, you just uh, talk like I'm talking to you right now. I mean, God's your father and your friend. And I just talk to him like I'm talking to you right now. He said, well, show me. So I showed him. And bless your soul, I went back in that trailer about 11.30 at night and lay down. And I could hear that bird back in the bushes when I went to sleep at 1.30. I could hear that fellow still talking to God. Over an hour back there, talking to the Lord. Now, don't you know all men marvel when that bird came home? I got up the next morning and that blanket was folded up and the flashlight lying on top. And only two things missing. Why in his Bible? <laughs> and so I thought I came back up there around Harlan, Kentucky, or Carolina, or Cowpen, one of them places back up there in the mountains. Don't you know that was a rip when that bird came back in there? Uh, in and out of jail, in and out of chain gangs, ever since he was 15 years old. Don't you know that was one? I had a meet in the street of South Carolina one time at Spartanburg out there on Highway 29, and I preached on the street. I was drawing a picture out there on the street, you know, and I still do it. I preach on the street. I'll be preaching the street next Saturday down in Pensacola. I hope if God gives me good health, I'll be preaching the street till I'm 70, 80 years old. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I get down there and stand up a truck in downtown Pensacola, my hometown, where all my friends, all my enemies live. And all the doctors and lawyers and bankers live and stand up there across Morgan's and put my finger on them and saying, you go to hell if you don't get right. Folks say, well, yeah, but you shouldn't treat them that way. I don't owe them nothing.